very pleased to introduce Dr. Martha Nance, who attended Yale University and Virginia Commonwealth University before making her way to God's country for her neurological training in the mid-1980s, and she has been here ever since. She has been the medical director of Struthers Parkinson Center since 2000. She's presenting about genetics and Parkinson's today and the newest research from the Parkinson's Foundation titled PD Generation Initiative. So let's welcome Dr. Martha Nance. Wow, what a crowd for um, so early on a Tuesday morning. Why don't you guys give yourselves a round of applause, just get your hands warmed up again. So. Um, so, you know, one of the cool things about the brain, I think why many of us went into neurology is that there are so many different ways to think about the brain. You just spent an hour thinking about the um, brain as an electrical system, the, the wiring and the cables and electrical stimulation and pulse width and voltage and amplitude and all these things that I don't know anything about. Um, you can think about the brain um, from sort of a biochemistry point of view. You can think about it from, well, a genetics point of view. So um, I'm going to spend the next um, few minutes talking about a new initiative that's being funded by the Parkinson Foundation. I made a mistake and put all my disclosure stuff way at the end. We're supposed to do that first. But my disclosures are that I am the director of a Parkinson Foundation Center of Excellence, and I'm also on the steering committee for this um, PD, um, we're supposed to pronounce it PD generation. I just think that sounds silly. So uh, PD generation, um, the, the Parkinson Foundation genetic and Parkinson's initiative. So, you know, what causes Parkinson's? That's, you know, the first question everybody asks when they get diagnosed is, why me? Why did this happen? How did it happen? What did I do? Um, was it something I did, didn't do, smoked, ate, um, you know, breathed, um, someplace I worked, something I didn't do? You know, is it, um, is it something I was born into? Is there a genetic component? And I think um, as we've, worked over the years, we have um, come more and more to realize it's really both. So some of the environmental factors that we aren't going to be talking about, um, things like Agent Orange, um, exposure to welding fumes, head trauma, protective factors. We, we know, we've known for years that men seem to have a higher frequency of Parkinson's than women. So is it that is it the occupational exposure of men, or is it the estrogen somehow has a protective effect? We still don't know the answer to that. Um, every epidemiology study they've ever done has shown that people who smoke have a lower risk of Parkinson's, and no, that doesn't mean that you should start smoking. Um, you know, lower risk, you know, people who get a, I won't talk about immunizations, that's a hot topic now, but, um, you know, so so is there something about nicotine that somehow protects people from Parkinson's, or is it that the kind of people who get hooked on smoking have an inherently lower risk of, of getting Parkinson's? Dopamine is kind of an addiction drug in the brain, so if you have high levels of dopamine to start with because you are addicted to smoking, maybe you have a lower risk of Parkinson's. So we don't know which way the association works. But we've also known for years that 15 or 20 percent of people with Parkinson's have a, um, a close relative, a first degree relative, a sibling, <coughs> a parent, a, a, a child um, with Parkinson's. How many people in the room who have Parkinson's have an affected family member, a cousin, a mother, a sibling? Yeah, quite a few people raising their hand. How many people? don't know anybody back to Adam and Eve and their family that ever had Parkinson's, and there you are. Yeah, so it's kind of, you know, some people do, some people don't. Um, it's that observation, though, that kind of initially made us think there, maybe there is something to the genetics, and this, this may not impact on everybody in the room, but let's at least tease out that part of Parkinson's that, that is influenced by genetics. So, and I apologize for, you know, my eyes glaze over when I think about electricity and, you know, voltage and amps and resistance. 
And probably some of you, your eyes glaze over when people start showing you pictures of cells and chromosomes. It's really exciting stuff, though. So a little vocabulary. Um, your, your body is made up of millions of cells. In the center of each cell is the, the core part is called the nucleus. Inside the nucleus are the chromosomes. Um, you get two copies of each chromosome because you get one complete set of chromosomes in mom's egg and one complete set of chromosomes in dad's sperm. And those two cells join together to make the cell that's your first cell and you get a double copy of each chromosome. So you have two copies then of each gene. The genes are what's contained on the chromosomes that are actually sort of like recipes or instructions. So you can think of the gene as being a recipe that tells your cell how to make a particular chemical. The chromosomes are essentially the recipe book or the, um, if you want to think of it as volumes of an encyclopedia of recipes. Um, humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes, so it's like you have a, an encyclopedia that has 23 volumes. Um, and the, the encyclopedia contains all the recipes your cells might ever need to make whatever chemicals they need. All those things are housed in the nucleus, that center part of the cell. And you can actually see all that if you, if you look under a microscope. You can't actually see the genes. The genes are just made up of strings of chemicals um, called DNA. Um, and a mutation, mutation is a terrible word that we sort of can't avoid using when we talk about genetics. I think people, it, it has sort of emotional connotations of being a, a mutant. Um, but, but mutation is the word for a typo uh, in a particular gene. So if you read a gene um, down at the bottom of the slide, there's only four letters in your DNA. Um, those letters are A, C, G, and T. And for the biologists in the room, that stands for some particular chemicals, but you don't have to know anything about the chemicals to know that if you read a gene, uh, it's gonna be a sequence of those letters. And all the words in your genes are um, three letter words. So there's no four letter words in your DNA. That comes after. <laughs> um, so if you read a gene, it might read as in this one, AAC, TAG, TTT, CCG. Each of those is a word that, um, that tells the cell to put a particular something or other in the protein that it's making. So I always use the analogy, it's like if you had a, a recipe for um, uh, chocolate chip cookies. And it might say, add a cup of flour, add a cup of sugar, add some butter, add a chip, add a chip, add a little pinch of salt. And all it takes to make the recipe incorrect, um, in some cases, is changing one letter. So on that example, it goes AAC and then TGG instead of TAG. That would be like saying, add malt instead of salt to that chocolate chip cookie that you're making. Now, any given um, typo may or may not actually change the end product. It might not matter if you add a pinch of malt versus a pinch of salt to your chocolate chip cookie. You may still have a functioning cookie by the end of it. But what if you left out a whole word? Um, if there is a deletion or a, a, a word just sort of left out, well, then you'd end up with chocolate, chookies, chocolate chip cookies with no butter. And that's not going to work. So, um, so um, we get two copies of each gene, one from mom, one from dad. There are about 30,000 of these recipes, 30,000 of these genes um, contained in those 23 volumes. We all have typos, we all have mistakes. You can imagine if you have 30,000 of anything, there's gonna be some mistakes. And as I said, not all DNA sequence variants, in other words, not all typos um, cause diseases. And by the way, it's fortunate that you have two copies of each gene, because sometimes if you have one that's got a typo, it doesn't matter because you got the other copy that's normal. And so if you have you know two copies of your um, uh, a recipe book, and one of them has a page ripped out of it. Well, how on earth are you going to make, you know, um, Cajun gumbo if the page about gumbo is, is ripped out of the book? Well, thank God you've got a second copy of that same recipe book that doesn't have that page ripped out, 
And so you just go to that other copy of the book and make your gumbo. Sounds good. So that's the easy part of the talk. Um, the more complicated part is when you start talking about the genetics of Parkinson's disease, which is complicated. Um, and that's why it's been a little slow coming to the clinic. There are at least 25 different genes that people have explored or looked at or seen or, or um, studied in people with Parkinson's that seem to be important. Um, and there's, there are some big uh, biology words that I threw up on the screen there. Um, so different um, genetic conditions can be passed on in families in different ways. So there are some um, traits, um, you know, if you ever have a um, family or somebody's got a really big nose, and you're not too surprised if their son has a really big nose, and you're not too surprised if the grandson also has a really big nose, well, that's a trait being passed in a dominant fashion. Um, one parent has one copy of that gene, and it passes on to the child and passes on to the grandchild and so on. That's a brief example of sort of dominant inheritance, that the bad gene, in a sense, or that trait dominates over whatever might be present on the other copy of the gene. And then there are recessive um, uh, conditions where you need to get a double hit of a, uh, a gene mutation in order to get the disease. A classic example of that would be cystic fibrosis. Anybody know anybody with cystic fibrosis? Um, you know, fairly common genetic condition that affects children where um, the only people who get the disease are people who have a, a, a double hit of a, of a gene with a mistake in it. And thinking about that, how does that happen? Well, one parent has to have a single copy of that abnormal gene. The other parent also has a single copy of the abnormal gene. The parents are fine. They don't have cystic fibrosis because they have a second copy that's normal but the child got a double, a double hit of the abnormal gene and therefore developed the disease. We refer to that as recessive inheritance. And sometimes you kind of scratch your head and you're not quite sure how this condition is being passed on in the family for a couple of reasons. We'll talk about this in a minute with the Parkinson's genes that there are, um, uh, you, you sometimes find situations where people have a gene mutation that can clearly cause a disease, but it didn't cause that disease in that particular person. How could that be? So if you, um, uh, another disease that I um, work with is a disease called Huntington's disease. If you got the abnormal Huntington's gene, you will get Huntington's disease, unless you get hit by a truck first. So you could imagine somebody lives to be 42 years old, never has symptoms of Huntington's disease, dies of something else, and was felt to live their whole life without ever having Huntington's disease, even though they had that abnormal gene, because that gene wasn't really destined to, to cause uh, enough damage in the brain to lead to symptoms until that person was older. This is a real important issue um, in Parkinson's. Some of the genes that we're talking about um, they, they don't cause you to get Parkinson's when you're 10. You don't get Parkinson's when you're 20. Um, some of the genes we're talking about may lead to, quote, young onset Parkinson's, but even young onset Parkinson's is like age 30. Um, and some of the genes that we're going to talk about lead to um, Parkinson's that has sort of an average-ish age of onset. The typical age of Parkinson's is 60, 65, how many people were under age 60 when their Parkinson's began? How many people were over age 60 when their Parkinson's began? So, you know, again, we're sort of 50-50 in the room or maybe a little bit more in the older age group. But we often um, talk about the, the genetics term is penetrance. So if you have an abnormal gene that clearly can cause the disease, but you lift a long, full, happy life and never got the disease, then you say that that um, is an example of reduced penetrance, that somehow that abnormal gene, if you want to think of it, didn't penetrate uh, hard enough to actually cause any disease, or you died young of something else. 
So we often, in the context of Parkinson's, will talk about age-related penetrance. So if you have this abnormal gene, does it increase your risk of having Parkinson's by age 50 or 60 or 70 or 80? Um, so you'll see some slides about that later in the talk. And another biology word that probably looks kind of scary up there is phenocopy. So even if you are um, uh, studying a, um, in a research study, a family where there's 10 people in the family with Parkinson's disease, great grandpa had it, grandma had it, dad had it, and by the way, so did the aunt and uncle, and now you have a, a fourth generation, a, 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 you know adult child who has Parkinson's four generations of people with Parkinson's, you're clearly looking for a genetic cause. You find a gene uh, that seems to have caused Parkinson's in nine of those people in that family, and then you have a tenth person in the family who has Parkinson's but has does not have the gene mutation. How could that happen? Well, maybe that person uh, served in Vietnam and was exposed to Agent Orange. Maybe that person was a welder. Um, and snorted welding fumes. You know, so there, there can be people, even in a family where there are a lot of people with a genetic cause of Parkinson's, there may be people in the family who don't have a genetic cause but still have Parkinson's. Does that make sense? So, there, so we're sort of trying to tease apart the, the sort of uncommon genetic causes of Parkinson's, but there's still other people who have what seems to be mostly environmental causes, and some of those people could still be in the family that where Parkinson's is running the family. So, and that's what phenocopy means, is it's a non-genetic cause of what otherwise um, looks like a genetic disease. All right, here's the dreaded list of genes. Um, so, the quiz is at the end of the hour. Um, I, the, these are, um, you know, each researcher who studies a gene believes his gene is the most important or her gene is the most important gene um, going. Um, but some are um, sort of statistically more important than others. Some are more commonly seen um, in patients. Um, the ones in black are pretty rare and, you know, maybe have reported, been reported in one family or two. Um, but really don't seem to be responsible for Parkinson's in a very large percent of people. Um, the ones in red are the ones I'm going to talk about a little bit more in the next set of slides, and the ones in blue are also being studied um, as part of this PD generation initiative that I'll talk about at the end. So there are seven genes that we're going to be studying in the, the Parkinson's initiative. Um, but I'm going to talk about these, uh, the four red ones next. And by the way, I think most of my slides are as they should be, but I actually added a couple at the end. So you have most of my slides in front of you, but not quite all of them. Um, so Parkin. Um, Parkin is, um, is an interesting gene that uh, leads, that is responsible for something like 50% of Parkinson's disease occurring um, or beginning under age 30. How many people in the room had Parkinson's starting under age 30? Maybe one. So um, um, it's pretty uncommon for Parkinson's to begin under age 30. But in those rare folks who have that onset at that young of an age, you can kind of guess that there might be a genetic contribution to a disease occurring, a neurodegenerative disease occurring that early in life. Um, and Parkin turns out to be a, a, a gene that is quite relevant for that population of patients. It requires a double hit of that abnormal gene to develop Parkinson's due to, uh, to the Parkin gene. Um, it may be a little bit more mutations or variants in this gene may be more common in some ethnic groups than others. Um, there are many possible variants. So uh, again, a typo could occur uh, anywhere along the course of the gene or a word gets left out, kind of like a page being ripped out of the, of the um, recipe book or um, you know, a big 
uh, you know, have you ever gotten a magazine that just sort of somehow had a big ink splotch over a particular word on a particular page? Uh, who knows what happened, but on your particular copy of that particular magazine, you can't read that particular word because it has an ink splotch over it. So you can have a deletion or a duplication of, of a particular word or it's, it's um, accidentally removed or just a typo, a single um, uh, uh, letter um, that's changed. And I've been uh, lobbying or arguing recently when I've given presentations that um, Parkinson's due to mutations in the Parkin gene is sufficiently different from Parkinson's disease that we should, we should even not call it Parkinson's disease anymore. So first of all, the onset is under age 30. Everybody else with Parkinson's disease has onset at age 50 or 60 or 70. So the age of onset is much different. Um, stiffness and uh, walking gait problems, kind of a spastic, stiff um, gait is somewhat more common in this condition. Tremor is somewhat less common. And even after people live on with this condition for years or decades, um, dementia is relatively uncommon where it, it, it starts to become more and more common in the typical average case of Parkinson's as you go out 20 plus years, uh, dementia becomes fairly common. And the other striking thing about, two other striking things about uh, Parkinson's due to Parkin mutations, normal sense of smell. How many people with Parkinson's in the room have, a, have noticed somewhere along the line their sense of smell is screwed up, it's bad? impaired sense of smell. How many people with Parkinson's in the room think their smeller is just wonderful? Two people, three people in the room think they smell just great. Well, you do smell great, uh, but, uh, but your ability to smell may not be so good. Um, so the vast majority of people with sort of average typical Parkinson's um, will have impaired sense of smell, but people with Parkin mutations don't. And the other thing is if you slice open the brain and look at it under the microscope, um, people who have mutations in the Parkin gene typically do not have Lewy bodies, um, which is the histological marker when you, the, the, when you look under the microscope of an average typical Parkinson's disease, the thing you're looking for to sort of confirm the diagnosis of Parkinson's is the presence of this blob inside the cell called the Lewy body. People with Parkin mutations don't have Lewy bodies, usually. Um, so I've been arguing that you know this starts to sound different on a number of counts, both what causes it, the age of onset, the typical symptoms, and even looking at the brain after, you, after you're gone. Um, should we even really call this Parkinson's disease? Well, looks enough like Parkinson's disease. It responds to the same medication, so it kind of gets lumped in together. So next is synuclein, which actually was first. Um, so, so synuclein was the, the first Parkinson's gene identified. And it was only about 20 years ago. So this is all um, kind of a new field, um, if indeed you think 20 years is new. Um, uh, so synuclein is actually the major component of the Lewy body. So when you see that blob inside the cells that are sick in Parkinson's, that, that blob is full of broken down old synuclein protein that starts to accumulate like a, a heap of trash inside the cell and ultimately sort of interferes with the function of the cell. So. Um, Synuclein is a dominantly inherited form of Parkinson's, meaning it runs directly from one generation to the next. Um, I actually just had a patient recently in my clinic who um, had an affected grandparent and an affected uh, parent or uncle or both, or I forget if somebody was sort of missing in that generation, and, um, and asked for genetic testing and turned out to have a synuclein mutation. Um, it, there's, there's a beginning thought that, that people with a synuclein mutation may be somewhat more likely to develop dementia um, or cognitive impairment as the disease progresses uh, and or that it may progress a little bit more um, quickly. This is, this is a relatively uncommon form of the disease and so we, it's not like we've got you know a thousand people in a room who all have this mutation. We're sort of basing this on 
you know, I have two patients and that guy has one and somebody else has a couple and, um, um, or you look within a family and you say, well, we have this big Greek Italian family in whom the gene was first identified and there's 25 people in that family who all had Parkinson's. Um, the problem with basing our whole understanding of a disease on 25 people from a single family is that those 25 people also share many other genes and they share a common environment and they share a similar ethnic background. And so you, you can't always, um, it, it's not safe to extrapolate from a single family to say, well, this is what the disease is going to look like um, in anybody in the world who has that mutation. Does that make sense? So you have to be a little careful about generalizing from a very small number of patients. But synuclein. So another one that's become very um, uh, important or interesting recently is a, is a gene called GBA, um, which encodes a, an uh, enzyme called glucocerebrosidase A, or some people call it G case, which is just easier to say. Um, so if you have mutations in both copies of the, of the GBA gene, um, then people will develop a um, neurodegenerative disease of childhood, like age two or five or eight, called Gaucher disease. Um, and it was an observation made in the early 2000s by a um, researcher named Ellen Sidransky who said, you know, if you look at the parents of people with Gaucher disease, so how do you get Gaucher disease? That's one of those ones where you have to get a double copy of the bad gene, which means each of your parents must be carriers of a single copy of the bad gene. And she looked at the parents of people with Gaucher disease and found that more of them had Parkinson's than you would think. And actually some people with sort of an odd variant of Gaucher disease that comes on later in life develop Parkinson kind of symptoms. So those two observations led them to say, we need to look at this a little more carefully. And we now, um, Gaucher disease is particularly common in the Ashkenazi Jewish population. And we now know that something like 10 to 15% of people of Ashkenazi Jewish um, heritage who have Parkinson's are curious of a single copy of a Gaucher variant. Um, that's interesting. Now there are many different variants reported in that gene. There are some that are that are sort of more common than others, um, but uh, but there are a number of different um, typos that can occur in that gene that can lead to a disease. There's again an early suggestion that this may be a little bit more rapidly progressive. Um, but what's really exciting is there are treatments now um, for kids with Gaucher disease where you simply um, uh, replace the missing enzyme um, and, and deliver that to the patients and then they, the brain works better and they hopefully it slows the progress of their disease. So the question is, should we now be um, offering that treatment to carriers of a single copy of that abnormal gene who might either have or be more likely to develop Parkinson's. Well, the first thing we need to know, need to know is who in the room carries a, a variant in the, in the Gaucher gene. Um, but that's kind of exciting that for this particular variant that may be responsible for um, you know, a small percent of people with Parkinson's, in the, in the Jewish population, maybe a higher percent, maybe, you know, two to five percent in the sort of um, melting pot of the American population. Um, but if we can identify those people, well, that's two percent of people with Parkinson's for whom there might be a specific um, treatment, uh, at least to be studied, don't know if it'll work or not, but at least to um, try a treatment for this particular variant of Parkinson's that's based specifically on the genetic abnormality that you detect. And along those lines, the fourth gene that I wanted to talk about is the um, LERC2. Oops, oh, before I get to that, so both GBA and synuclein have come up in studies looking for genes associated with um, a Parkinson variant called Lewy body disease. How many people know what Lewy body disease is or have heard of it? How many, how many people have never heard of Lewy body disease? A few. 
So Lewy body disease is a variant of Parkinson's that includes both the movement symptoms, but kind of coming on right at the same time as the movement symptoms is changes in cognition that are bad enough that you might use the word dementia and hallucinations, all starting right at the onset. And that, that doesn't happen in the typical average Parkinson patient. You kind of bump along shuffling and shaking for years or decades before you have significant cognitive impairment or start having hallucinations. So Lewy body is sort of a, in a sense, a worser or more intense from onset um, variant of Parkinson's. And when people have done studies to try to um, look at different genes to see which ones seem to pop up in association with Lewy body, both GBA and synuclein have, have popped up. So on to LERC2, which is um, uh, another gene that's um, uh, kind of interesting in a couple ways. Um, so um, it's the leucine-rich repeat kinase 2. Whenever you see the word kinase, that's just a, an enzyme that has to do with the general housekeeping in the cell. It's really important for all kinds of different functions uh, within a cell. And um, interestingly, unlike most um, uh, gene mutations that, if anything, cause the resulting protein to be inactive or made poorly or fall apart, um, the mutations that have been associated with Parkinson's in LERT2 actually make that enzyme more active. So it's a little bit like if you're making your um, uh, chocolate chip cookie and you're supposed to add an egg, or uh, is it two eggs? Two eggs. Um, and for some reason, the word two got changed to six. <laughs> so you added the six eggs to your chocolate chip cookies, you know, and you have an over-exuberant cookie. So we have an over-exuberant enzyme here if you have a, a, uh, these variants in the LERT2 gene. And again, this turned out to be somewhat more common in the Ashkenazi population, or is first um, de described in that group. So a particular variant in this gene called G2019S is also present in up to sort of 10, 12 percent of Ashkenazi Jewish people with Parkinson's. And up to 40 percent of Berber Arabs with Parkinson's have a variant in this gene. Anybody in the room Berber Arab in heritage? Um, anybody Basque? So a different variant in that same gene, the L1441R variant, um, is present in the vast majority of Basque people with Parkinson's. So that's a clue that this gene is important if it's not just this one variant that causes a disease in one particular population, but a different variant in the same gene that overactivates the gene is related to Parkinson's in a whole different population. That makes you sort of feel this gene actually is probably important. Um, and uh, anybody ever sent their spit off to 23andMe? Um, anybody get a test report back that says you do or don't have a, did anybody get a test report back saying that you do have a um, gene that increases your risk of Parkinson's? No. Anybody get a report back that says you did not have any gene thing that seemed to increase your risk of Parkinson's? Was that confusing to anybody? Yes? It was confusing to Aaron. Okay. Um, yeah, so the 23andMe test looks for that one variant in that one gene. Oh. So you know, I had a patient who did the 23andMe test and came back and said, I'm so confused. And I said, why? Well, you told me I have Parkinson's. I said, yeah, you do. Uh, well, I did the gene test. It was normal. I said, yeah, so what? And she said, well, but, but you told me I have Parkinson's. I said, you do. <laughs> but you don't have Parkinson's due to a G2019S variant in this particular gene. But there are many other things that can cause Parkinson's, which you guys now know. Even many other variants in that same gene that they're not looking for could cause Parkinson's. She could still have a LERT2 variant, but if she's Basque, maybe she's got the 1441 variant. Um, so, um, so you have to be really careful, and I'll mention this just in a second, about um, what um, gene test is actually being done, because not all gene tests look for every variant in every gene. 
The other exciting thing about LERC2 is uh, whenever there's an enzyme that's overactive, um, that's something chemists and pharmas, pharmacologists have been dealing with for years, is making drugs that block enzymes, uh, just in general. So, um, so there is a particular um, tr um, uh, trial of a drug to block the effects of this kinase enzyme that's been overactivated by this gene mutation. So there was a pilot trial reported by a company called Denali. So you can all run home and look up Denali. And, um, and they're uh, really proposing to do a larger scale trial um, in people who have that particular variant and that particular gene, which sounds like it may not be relevant, at least for the people in the room who've had their 23andMe test. Nobody had a 2019S variant, but we don't know who else in the room might. So what are the challenges in the clinic? I, uh, even though I like genetics, I really haven't done that much genetic testing um, in the Parkinson's clinic. Um, insurance often doesn't want to pay for it because they say it doesn't matter. Um, which gene should I test for? There's that list of 25. There's a list of seven. There's these four. Do I test for all of them? One, two? Um, um, and as I just said, not all lab tests are created equal, so you have to be a little bit careful about what test did you actually order and what did the result actually mean. Um, there's also a potential to discover what we call a variant of uncertain significance, um, which is to say, what if you have a typo in the gene that nobody's ever seen in the history of the world before? Uh, we're all new to sequencing genes and reading them. So if you have a little A that turned to a T at one particular spot in one particular gene and nobody's ever reported that particular gene change in the literature, we don't know whether it's important or not. Remember some variants, if I change salt to malt, I'm still gonna get a chocolate chip cookie. So changing that S to an M didn't really matter. And so some typos may not cause disease and there's often a time where we don't know whether a particular variant that we saw in a gene has anything to do with anything. <laughs> but three years later, we may decide that it is relevant because somebody reported four more patients with Parkinson's who had that same variant. There was actually an article in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, one of those over the weekend, I don't know if anybody saw it, about um, the roller coaster ride of a, a mother whose child had some odd form of epilepsy, and they went through this um, genome sequencing thing. And they, and first they thought it, that they had a variant in, you know, gene X Y Z, and so they said, yes, great. So they went to the X Y Z club. They started a foundation. They raised money to support research on X Y Z disease, and then five years later, the researchers decided that that wasn't that wasn't it wasn't a variant that caused the disease, and they had to sort of drop all their friends. <laughs> they said, well, you got a mutation in this gene over here that now we think this one's important. And they were a little bit reluctant to start going to the you know, ABC club <laughs> after their experience with XYZ disease. Um, so you know, our understanding of the significance of these vari gene genetic variants is going to evolve rapidly as we do, do more genetic testing. And so there's a potential for a little bit of a roller coaster ride that somebody says, no, I don't think it's important, and then they call you back two years later and say, oh, I do think it is important now, or vice versa. Sometimes patients aren't interested um, because, again, same thing the insurance company says, it's not really a treatment that hinges on the result of the gene test yet, although there is the potential to participate in a research study for LERC2 or for GBA. Um, we are not experienced in talking to patients um, about this complex stuff. It takes me a whole hour to wade through all this with you. Um, and because uh, it, it is complicated. And by the way, often the people who are more interested in your gene test results than you are your children. Because um, they're the ones who are saying, well, I already know you've got Parkinson's. What I want to know is what's my risk of getting Parkinson's because you've got it. Um, and we really don't know what to tell them. So uh, a study done by one of my buddies showed that uh, for GBA, again, I talked about this age-related penetrance. So the risk of developing Parkinson's by age 80 in two or three different studies where they tried to look at this, if you have one of those 
Parkinson-related variants, the risk of getting Parkinson's by age 80 is somewhere between 7 and 30 percent. Okay. Does that help your 30-year-old son to understand what his risk of Parkinson's is? Well, it's 7 to 30 percent if you've got the GBA variant, but then there's also, you could just get it from the way everybody else gets it, it just sort of happens. Um, and gee, if you're free of that abnormal gene, it doesn't mean that you can't possibly get Parkinson's. So how does that help? Um, this shows um, for LERC2 um, that uh, the red, the dark, the solid red line is, shows that there's a 26% risk of getting Parkinson's by age 80 in people who have the G2019S variant. So this was done, uh, this is part of the Michael J. Fox Ashkenazi Jewish LERC2 consortium. So 500 people who provided blood samples um, and their 2,500 um, relatives. And, um, and you can see that the risk of Parkinson's goes up with age, as it does for all of us. The black line is the risk of developing Parkinson's in people who are not carriers of that gene variant. So 10% of those people develop Parkinson's by age 80, but 26% of people who had that genetic variant develop Parkinson's by age 80. Whatever that means. And interestingly, I don't know if you can see this at all, but the top line, and maybe you just look at the words rather than the lines, but, but it was interesting that um, for, it was different for men and women. These are the slides that aren't in your packet. So 22% um, uh, risk of uh, Parkinson's by age 80 in the men who were carriers versus 15%. We know Parkinson's is more common in men without any genetic cause, so 15% in the non-carriers. In the females, there's only a 7% risk of Parkinson's in the non-carriers of that genetic variant, but actually a 29% risk um, in, of getting it by age 80 in, in the women who carried that abnormal gene. The authors of the study put a different spin on this, but I, 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 I think it's kind of interesting that the, the women who carry the gene actually have an even higher risk of getting Parkinson's than men with that abnormal gene. Isn't that interesting? And, uh, but this, again, these were Ashkenazi Jewish people with the G2019S variant. What if you're not Ashkenazi? What if you have a different variant? Uh, we don't know. We don't know what to tell you. So the PD Generation Initiative um, is led by um, uh, Roy Alcalay, who's a, a researcher um, at Columbia University. And the goal is really to understand the contribution of genetics to Parkinson's and, uh, and then understand how we can um, provide information back to people. How do we counsel people? How do we, um, how do, we do this in the context of our clinics? Um, the study will begin at six pilot sites and then kind of spread out from there to other um, Parkinson Foundation centers of excellence. We'll be testing for those seven genes, the red and blue ones uh, in the slide. There will be pre-test genetic counseling, partly by video, partly interacting with your doctor, um, neurologic exam, um, and then blood draw. And then we're also testing, um, is it better to get results of this test from your doctor um, who may or may not be as skilled in the language of genetics, um, but is your doctor, or is it better or equally good or better maybe to, to have results of this gene test provided by a genetic counselor over the telephone? Um, you don't have to come back to clinic, so if it's, you know, if you live in Bemidji and it's February and it's Minnesota or March or May or <laughs> September, um, you know, you don't have to drive back down and see the doctor. You just talk to the genetic counselor for a phone appointment. Uh, and that's a person who, at least in theory, is quite fluent in understanding genetics, may not be quite as skilled in the neurology part. So does it matter? How, how can we do this? There are not enough genetic counselors in the world um, to actually do genetic testing on a million people with Parkinson's. But there also aren't enough neurology doctors knowledgeable about genetics to do this either. So how are we going to make this work in, in clinical practice? And then we'll do surveys six and 12 months later to see, you know, do you remember the results and was it useful and were you satisfied with how the, the procedure went? Um, so, and that's it. So there's my, my uh, um, disclosures.
So I'll stop there, and we have one minute for questions. All right, we'll get over to the questions. Anybody close to me want to whisper a question that I can repeat? No, okay. We keep talking about the DNA, which is the, uh, the cookie, rather than talking about the RNA, which as I un recall, would be the recipe. Is this correct? No, so um, what I didn't put in this particular slide, I didn't emphasize, <clears throat> so the, the volumes of the encyclopedia are contained in the nucleus, which you might as well think of as being the library. Um, but you don't actually make your chocolate chip cookies in the library, you make them in the kitchen. The kitchen is called the ribosome, but you know what, you can't take that encyclopedia into the kitchen, because it'll get all dirty and you'll rip pages out of it. So what you have to do if you're going to use a recipe to make a protein is you make a Xerox copy of that particular recipe that then has to go from the library to the kitchen and then is used to make that protein. That, that Xerox copy is called RNA. And there are a lot of um, studies in other diseases, so my other pet disease, Huntington's disease, we're embarking on studies where you um, put into the cell basically a sheet of black paper that sticks to that RNA Xerox copy so you can't read that copy. Then you don't read the abnormal gene, you don't make the abnormal protein. So yes, RNA is important. Um, but at this point, when we talk about what uh, the, the um, mistake is, kind of the mistake is in the DNA. So then you end up with a Xerox copy of that gene that also has the mistake in it. We have another question right here. Well, I'm just finding out <laughs> after all these years <laughs> that everything I'm getting wrong with me seems to, they say it's, it's your Parkinson's. <laughs> whether it's the hallucinations or but just, there's just so many things that I've had to deal with and I'm finding out later on, and like my urologist said, yeah, that's the Parkinson's. So I'm not yeah. sure I'm going with this, but. Yeah, so, and that's actually been, um, it, it's a challenge on a number of counts. So, you know, what is Parkinson's? Parkinson's has morphed um, over my professional, well, I, probably before my, professional career, um, uh, before we had levodopa, um, probably the course of Parkinson's was more the time frame of the current um, uh, course of Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's three years, 10 years, um, and then you're not there anymore. Um, people with Parkinson's without levodopa, imagine yourself 10 years into Parkinson's, <laughs> anybody come in for on-off testing for, for DBS? have to come in having not taken your pills and you need a wheelchair to get into the clinic. Um, that's what your Parkinson's is like. <laughs> um, if you didn't have levodopa 10 years into Parkinson's, you wouldn't be able to move. You would get the complications of immobility, um, you know, falls, pneumonia, and so on, and people would die much earlier. Because of levodopa, it's a little bit like insulin um, for diabetics. Uh, nobody remembers a world before there was insulin for diabetes, but diabetes was a fatal disease. Well, now people expect to live indefinitely with diabetes, but 30 years into diabetes, you're not too surprised if you have complications of diabetes like nerve troubles or kidney troubles. Similarly, um, people now live on with Parkinson's to find that it affects all kinds of things besides just how you move. Um, so cognition, the autonomic nervous system that controls things like um, bladder function, blood pressure control, constipation, and so on. And that creates a little bit of a problem for some of our studies, um, particularly with things like Lewy body disease. Um, what is Lewy body disease? Well, the definition is you have to have Parkinson motor symptoms, cognitive symptoms, and hallucinations all starting on day one. But then there's people who say, well, it didn't start on day one, but you know, by year 10, I had some of this. Or other people say, well, 20 years into my Parkinson's, I started having hallucinations and cognitive impairment. Does that mean that I now have Lewy body disease? So how do you define Lewy body disease? It's been hard to sort of study that, that variant of Parkinson's. 
But yeah, it is a complex disease, and that you know, we don't know. What if we fix the LERC2 enzyme? Is that going to improve all of the symptoms of Parkinson's or just the movement symptoms? We don't know. We don't know. But it's an exciting era to even think about specific treatments for specific underlying causes of Parkinson's. Uh oh. Brace yourself. What uh, was just, day number one? I must have the same urologist as my here up here. Uh, we all know that we've had symptoms of Parkinson's long before we were diagnosed. Then what percent, and I was diagnosed two years before I knew it, because the two doctors who diagnosed me didn't tell me. So what percentage of people walking around out here really have it and would benefit from treatment? And we don't know. Yeah, so, um, and that's the other sort of great white hope of genetics um, that may or may not come true. But, um, but as I said, the people who really care about your gene test results may not be so much you as your children. We're going to take a few more questions as lunch service starts. That's fine that, with me. Okay. Is, is Lewy body disease only seen when you dissect the brain, or is it seen on MRI scans or other tests? So, so can you see Lewy body disease on an MRI scan? Um, not, uh, no. Um, it doesn't really look different than Parkinson's on any of the scans that we do. DAT scan is another kind of scan that you can't distinguish Parkinson's from Lewy body with a DAT scan. Um, the pathologically, somebody with Lewy body disease has Lewy bodies in a more broader distribution than the, the average you know, person with Parkinson's for that same duration of time. Although later on in Parkinson's, what happens is you have Lewy bodies in a broader distribution in the brain. So I often refer to my patients who are 20 plus years into Parkinson's and now have dementia and now have hallucinations. I say, well, you don't have the textbook definition of Lewy body disease, but you have something that's tantamount to Lewy body disease. It might as well be, it's just that you don't meet the textbook definition. The disease has um, moved on beyond just the movement parts of the brain to affect other parts of the brain, and that's what's leading to the dementia and the hallucinations. So, um, I'm wondering if Struthers is going to participate in that initiative, and will it be open to all people with Parkinson's or just certain, like the Basque and the <laughs> Jews and the Arabs? Um, so glad you asked. Um, so um, oddly enough, we are one of those six um, centers where we're going to be one of the initial sites um, piloting the study. Um, and um, at this point, I'd say we're happy to take anybody who wants to come. We're not quite up to snuff yet. It's been like many research studies, um, you know, it was supposed to get started first quarter, and well, it was really going to get started second quarter, and then there's, well, anyway, hopefully by, um, before the end of the summer, we will be up and rolling with the study. So, you know, feel, anybody who's interested in learning more, um, we don't have our sort of advertising and descriptive stuff written up yet for distribution, but um, you can certainly call the center, call Struthers, and say you're interested in this genetics research study. They'll put you in touch with our research group, and then we could contact you once it's up and going. So, Another question here. Dr. Nance, have they made any um, improvements, or has the FDA come any further in getting the sentiment uh, approved for being taken in a different way versus going through the digestion tract for people who have a problem with that? We will uh, cover that in the next yeah, discussion. So, Dr. Yeah, so yep, Dr. Joseph It'll be a good Matsumoto. talk for Dr. Matsumoto. Um, so I'll, I'll defer to him on that. And the answer is um, yes. Everybody's hungry. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nance. Yeah.